My angle here is going to be slightly different from what's been said before. I'm going to talk to you about open access from the point of view of a scientist and a scientist who started the journal and try to explain to you the issues that arose in that process and the way this journal is going and probably think about those of you who may, may be wanting to start the journals, the kind of issues that will, that will uh, face you. Uh, <coughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, the, the, we had been talking in the, in the field of parasitology in Britain uh, about creating a malaria journal for some years, uh, uh, but cre creating an, uh, a traditional paper-based paper journal seemed to be a, an enterprise that nobody really wanted to face. Part of anything, it's going to be very costly. We, were not, we had doubts of whether there was enough of a market to actually have a, a, our own specialist malaria journals. And when, when I heard a, a talk by Fiona Godley in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the, I think it was in two, 2000, at the very early days of Biomed Central, she was at the time a, a, a publisher there, uh, and uh, I thought that that's it, we, we, we'll try it in that model with Biomed Central. And uh, <coughs> the, from the beginning, it was a uh, uh, a journal that was obviously, like, like all Biomed Central journals, peer-reviewed. We, because we were, we were concerned that, uh, uh, not sure what, what online journals uh, would be seen as, and we were certainly, certainly very worried that it would be seen as, uh, as, as spam or as something that you unwanted uh, 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 thing that came through you to the internet. Um, my med central colleagues will tell you for a long time I resisted any any form of uh, publicity, mail shots, and things to avoid that. And we we really got uh, from the beginning uh, tried to get our paper traditionally copy edited so that they they, they are they seem as much as possible as what you get from uh, uh, a traditional paper based journal. Uh, <coughs> obviously the the, the uh, from, at the beginning, the first year, I think those articles were free, but when, uh, when APCs were introduced, of, of course, we were very worried that suddenly we won't get any articles anymore, but we didn't. We got actually twice as many the next year as we had the year before. So the, 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 uh, the, the actually having to pay for, the, for the, the getting a, an article published uh, wasn't actually a, such a handicap. Uh, people did find funds, and from the beginning also uh, uh, there was waivers given to authors from the developing world. Uh, at the beginning I, I had to make a decision as an editor to who, who to give waiver to, but luck, fortunately this was ra rapidly taken over by the administration of, 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 of Biomed Central, uh, who could do that on the basis of uh, a, double, uh, uh, a World Bank uh, uh, list of countries, which is a lot better. The articles that have given the waiver much before, not, not on, a, on the basis of the content, but on the basis of geographical origin. Uh, <coughs> now, wh why a malaria journal, you may, you may ask? Uh, uh, and of course, uh, the concept is not entirely new. Uh, tu tubercle, uh, a, a journal about tuberculosis exists since since 1919, uh, which, which of course uh, um, s indicates that uh, in a discipline, it's actually good to have a, a, a specialist right? because as you, you really want to have the, the, the comfort as a reader or as a scientist of having something to look at as your first port of call. And I think that's where Malay Journal is going. That's where that's what we are actually achieving that in. Uh, when we were approaching our 10 years of existence, uh, I decided to do a little bit of uh, uh, looking at what happened and what, uh, so I did a survey. So at the beginning in, in 2001, when we started, 20% um, of 1,600 articles on malaria were actually published in a handful of specialist tropical medicine parasitology journals. Uh, American Journal of Tropical Medicine being the top of the list. Uh, <coughs> and so I've, I've followed these journals over the years, 
uh, and at the same time the evolution of Malaya Journal. Uh, that's what Malaya Journal looks like. It's an online, an online journal uh, only. We don't have a paper version. Uh, and on the on the <coughs> on the, 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 the home page of the journal, this is uh, all the recent articles. Uh, usually with a, a picture that uh, uh, is very carefully chosen to actually represent what's happening in the in the article on the basis that uh, a picture is worth a thousand words and a few words to explain in as lay language as possible uh, what, what the article is about. And also pointing out we've got various sections that are thematic series like travel medicine, malaria elimination, and we point out uh, uh, various meetings and, uh, uh, that happened on malaria. <coughs> now, in that follow-up that we made in 2009, uh, <coughs> you can see the, the, the blue line is, that, is a, the increase in the number of papers, which somehow we have lost the numbers in there. Uh, never mind. A uh, number of papers uh, of Malaya Journal, which in, in 2009 was f far above any other journal uh, publishing on Malaya. So this is the tradi traditional journals that I mentioned uh, initially, the, 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 particularly that the green one is American Journal of Tropical Medicine. They all remained pretty much the same throughout. Uh, I think there have been some, some efforts by the American Journal to, to uh, 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 sort of uh, show that they, they, that they still exist, and so they, they made some special supplements on Malaya and so on. But uh, pretty much remaining on the same line of about 100 articles per year. And in 2009, Malaya Journal had about 300, uh, over 300. And in, we followed that up in 2010, Malaya Journal had moved to 380. But there a new, a new, a new journal had uh, starting to show as uh, as was said earlier, PLOS One, which in 2010 had 145 articles on malaria, and in 2011 moved to 300 and 230. The two other PLOS publication uh, also has have quite a number of. So these are all open access uh, uh, journals, while the traditional journals uh, have remained essentially uh, paper-based and subscription only, but uh, in, to, to some extent becoming open access after an, a number of months of publication, which is, which is a model that is quite common. <coughs> uh, so in, in 2011, Malaya Journal was pu publishing 13% of all papers of malaria. So that, that actually corresponds to what I was saying earlier, the sort of a comfort uh, for the specialist that Malaya Journal becomes first port of call when you when you you, you want to look at the journals which are, have uh, ha, have been published recently. That's where you go first. Uh, <coughs> and uh, but have we got uh, have we actually got quality? So the measure of quality, of course, we is a difficult one. Uh, impact factor has been uh, has been uh, rightfully rubbished by Eve earlier on, and. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, uh, but it's there. You can't, you can't actually avoid it. Uh, the quality of the editorial board is, is important. It's not actually a measure of the journal, or something you can use as a measure, but obviously if you see the names of, of uh, 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 specialists on the board, you can see the, you have a certain degree of confidence that uh, uh, what you want to write in the, in, the, in the journal will actually have somebody on the board that may understand it. Uh, that's actually helpful. Uh, and the board is a very active board. Uh, they, they contribute to the not just nom names that have been put on the list, they actually actively work in peer reviewing and commenting and helping in various decision making. Uh, <coughs> the, something probably unique in journals, we actually change our editorial board membership that by 20% every year in a uh, more or less random fashion, that is to say we remove those who want to be removed because they're too busy, and the rest are selected randomly. This sometimes, for me, it's, it's, it's actually a process that, okay, I, 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 I help creating it, but uh, 
it's sometimes annoying when you have really a really active and uh, uh, a helpful uh, member of the editorial board who has to come off. But we, we've accepted that this is how, how it has to work. Uh, <clears throat> the peer review process is very traditional. We, we send the paper to two or three uh, reviewers and take the comments uh, in, uh, in the decision making. Uh, <clears throat> Now the copy editing we we do for every paper uh, 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 copy editing uh, of of course that is not standard of all uh, biomed central journals but this is something that we do and we feel it's important um, now uh, the metrics uh, I come back to that also point for, uh, about the influence. The metrics, uh, impact factor, eigenfactors, all, all series of factors that are used for metrics, but of course uh, uh, impact factor is, uh, is uh, the one that is most well known. Uh, it cannot be ignored for, for, the, for a journal. It can be ignored for an author, but it cannot be ignored for a journal because that's what defines uh, our relationship to other journals. I will, I will show you some values in a minute. Um, the, I think more important is how, how, how influential we are in, uh, in the discipline of, of malaria. How, uh, what, what is actually written in the journal, how that comes out and how, how that participates to policy making or to uh, changes in methods of diagnostics or treatment. And I think there we are doing doing actually very well. <clears throat> of course, uh, I, I put it at the end the quality of publisher. I forgot that almost. But that's very important. I will I will come at the end of my talk to something that is coming up at the moment and which is important for new journals uh, who may not necessarily choose the right kind of publisher and how, how complicated that may be. Uh, <clears throat> So I've mentioned that. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the number of uh, publication is steadily increasing every year. The number of submissions is increasing. Uh, the, the number of publication is probably has now reached uh, maybe not quite a plateau, but it's, it's, it's because we have now we are now obliged uh, to be more selective as time goes on. And of course, selection is is, uh, is also when the quality of the journal is good, uh, reviewers get tougher. The, the peer reviewers say, say, well, this is not good enough for this type of quality of journal. So the editor doesn't actually have to pressurize peer reviewers saying, oh, you have to be tougher. They do it spontaneously when they see the, the quality of the rest. So we're getting tougher peer reviews now than we did a few years ago. <clears throat> Now, the, the current impact factor is 3.19. Last year it was a little bit more, 3.5. Uh, the journal is second in tropical medicine uh, behind a PLOS journal. Uh, who, who you have seen this, publish, publishes very little malaria. Uh, but PLO, competing with PLOS is a, an almost impossible task. Uh, they have uh, PLOS is a publisher that has got an enormous uh, s support and uh, 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 capacity that is difficult to compete with. <clears throat> uh, you, can't, you can't read those, but that was, I was talking about influence in the subject, and many papers that come out in Malaya Journal are followed by press releases uh, in uh, prestige journals, Nature, Lancet, the, the general press. Those press releases are often stimulated by or arranged by the author, authors themselves with the press office of their university, but sometimes by the Biomed Central press office when we uh, point out that this may be an, a, an important issue. Uh, uh, for example, here is a, one of the latest press releases that I've seen in Nature Medicine <coughs> about a paper in Malaya Journal that looked at the, the global funding of malaria. Uh, uh, something else that happened last year is that the World Health Organization decided that their uh, committee 
which decides on, on policy recommendation on malaria would now be published in Malaya Journal. Uh, I think that is probably the biggest handshake that uh, we've had on the on on quality uh, uh, recognition, uh, uh, and uh, it's, it's it is very important. Uh, all all of us obviously would like to publish in prestige journals, uh, New, New England Journal of Medicine, Nature, and so on. We have got impact factor of of uh, 47, 34, and so on. But the number of people who actually achieved that, uh, as you can see in 2009, there were six papers on malaria in New England Journal of Medicine. And so it, obviously the chance of getting into those prestige journals are pretty small. Uh, so in most cases, if you are in a, in a, in a, in a field, we, we talked about that earlier, the impact factor it's, is actually very much depending on the field uh, that you're in, in a field like malaria, obviously, uh, getting uh, into a prestige journal is going to be pretty difficult, and you have to lower your, your, your expectations. As a, uh, this complicated table uh, will show you a few things uh, that uh, the, the sort of expectation of what I would call the traditional tropical medicine journal, like an American journal, uh, is, still, is, is below below three, and now we've, we, we've moved a little bit above that, and that is, I think, a feature of uh, of open access that uh, uh, we can rubbish in, in, in impact factor, but open access actually makes it easier to get a bigger impact factor than traditional journals uh, because it's it, it's more read. And therefore, it's going to be more cited. It goes, it goes without saying. Uh, <coughs> accesses, uh, can see my, uh, accesses are very high uh, and increasing uh, for the journal. Um, the journal const constantly, uh, 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 Deborah mentioned that this morning, uh, shows uh, that those who are highly accessed and I was pleased to see that some of the accesses we have in Malaya Journal of 7,026 or so are, are, are pretty good compared to what access of other, to other journals. Um, this is an impossible uh, image to see, but these are who, we, who, who read the journal. And obviously, uh, US, uh, UK, uh, in India uh, come up top. But uh, the, it looks pretty faded. But Af Africa, Africa does read malaria journals and, and quite quite well, probably almost as well as some some European countries. <coughs> so that that's quite good. Uh, <coughs> I pinched uh, one of your slides, Deborah, from, that you used last year, uh, showing the submission uh, to Biomed Central journals from Africa has the little blue blue lines at the bottom of those columns, obviously very small, but in, I, look, I, I did a little bit of counting, and in 2011, out of the 388 papers published, 105 had African scientists as first authors, that's 27% of articles published, 52 had African scientists as co-authors. And 14 concerned African issues, but without an African cause. But this is less worrying than you would think at first sight. This is actually usually policy uh, uh, papers written by somebody in the World Bank or in the WHO. <coughs> now, uh, just to change topic a little bit, is obviously libraries, such as the one here, big modern library, uh, uh, built uh, uh, for King's Ransom. You won't see those uh, very often in an African context. And you will see them less and less because uh, uh, scientists don't actually go to libraries very much because you can't get everything online. You, the, the future is to actually read the papers in your office or, in, uh, or at home. And uh, these are the images I like to see uh, because that is, that is where the future actually lies. Uh, but 
when I did my survey on the journals uh, and where, where, where malaria papers were published, I was actually shocked by the fact that 90% mal of malaria mortality is in Africa, and only 52 articles on malaria were actually published in African journals. Okay, this was a, a survey that was done on a certain type of, of journals that were looked at by PubMed, and obviously a, a biased survey it would be, I probably would have found many more if I had started digging a, 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 a bit more. But it, it actually showed me something that, uh, that there may be something, uh, a problem here uh, with African journals. And I felt that uh, in some ways open access may actually have a perverse effect in uh, uh, repressing uh, local and regional journals uh, because it becomes so much easier to go directly to international journals and publish there. Uh, <clears throat> but if you're a young scientist uh, or medical doctor wanting to publish your first paper, you're not going to the prestige journals. Uh, you may not even go to get into a, a high quality, uh, high impact factor journals. And you may not even get into the, the, the type of professional specialist journals such as Malaya journals with your work. And you may actually not bo be bothered about that. You really want your work to be seen by your peers locally. Uh, you want to write uh, in your local language or in your, in your national language. Uh, for example, uh, somebody mentioned, uh, uh, Eve mentioned, uh, uh, Franco Francophone African scientists publishing in French. They would be wanting to publish in French, or they would want to, to publish in, uh, in, uh, in Portuguese if they're from Mozambique or Angola. Uh, and that's far more important. And in some ways, uh, if we destroy those, that national, uh, that type of national journals, uh, it is going to be bad. And I, I feel that an effort should be made to, to do the opposite, that actually the online open access is a model that can help uh, uh, national African journals to develop and to, uh, or to be created. And there's, there's good opportunities now to do that. Because when you think about it, uh, uh, as long as your article is actually accessible uh, in uh, all over the world, it doesn't really matter if it's published in a in a in a high high, high impact factor journal. If if it if it's published in the uh, uh, in the Lim, Lim, Limpopo Journal of Medicine, it's it it can be read in uh, all over the world if it's if it's uh, online and open access, and if it's if it's actually a good paper, uh, it it should. Uh, it should be become available this way. So I, I will stop here. I was I wanted to say just one word, because there are some uh, some problems, uh, and I came across recently something that worried me a great deal, which I think should be put on your on your list of uh, of battles to fight, Eve, uh, and that is predator, predatory journals. Uh, quite clearly, quite clearly, uh, some people are taking advantage of the open access. A funding model, trying to get some quickly rich uh, publishers that uh, create bogus journals and so on. That in some way does worries me far less than somebody putting on uh, a list uh, available of all sorts of journals, most of them published in the developing world uh, by publishers based in the developing world. Uh, this, this sort of attitude is, I think, completely wrong. And it's destructive of what we said earlier. Of the, 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 among those are publishers who try new models of, uh, of new business models, new models of publishing, and to actually put them on the list, to tar them with this very nasty word of predatory, uh, they will never get rid of that label. And this really worries me, and, and, and I hope we're going to be able to discuss that in this meeting. Thank you.
Thank you so much, um, Irina Kuchma Eiffel. And uh, my question is uh, it looks like malaria is a discipline uh, that is real, a success story in open access movement. Because I think Welcome did a study that showed that well over 70% of uh, malaria articles are accessible in open access. And I was wondering whether this success story could be replicated in other disciplines like visualizes, sleeping sickness. I think a so direct answer uh, 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 was that one, uh, there was for some time a, a Biomed Central Journal uh, called, I think, Kinetoplasty Research or something like that, which uh, the discipline in this case was just too small and it didn't really make it. And it's not been merged with other, uh, with other articles into parasite and vectors in, in Biomed Central. So the, the, the subject is there, the papers are still there and they haven't been lost because the journal disappeared. It, it, it's probably more difficult in, in uh, smaller subject areas, but uh, it's not impossible. It's probably a question of, it, it doesn't really matter if uh, a journal stays small. Uh, uh, I, I think I said the same thing uh, some years ago when, when the uh, European Union was created about uh, re regional uh, groups like Breton or Basque or Welsh, uh, they can actually be led uh, to have a certain degree of independence, but before that they couldn't. The same is actually true there. You could actually have uh, small journals. It doesn't matter because it gets merged in the rest of the subject. You don't have to have 100 publications a year. If you have 10, <laughs> and if the publisher is happy to keep it going, uh, it, sh it should work. Uh, it's, a, it's an, an important issue. Uh, uh, la, 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 the keeping languages diversity in publication is, is very important. Uh, I think Biomed Central, for the moment, is not looking at having non-English publication. I think probably on the basis that uh, many people see English as, or some, some people say bad English as uh, the, 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 the language of science. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, articles can't actually be published in French or Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Swahili, uh, and have a, an English translation. Uh, at the moment, we have, we've gone the other way. Uh, articles published in English could actually have a uh, French, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, or Swahili, or whatever, uh, uh, abstract, which is one way of disseminating it. In, in, in a few papers, we actually made an, an interesting experiment to have a, an original article written in English, translated into French, and, the, and becoming accessible from within the article as an attachment. That is an, another way of doing it. And our members of TAFA are publishing there. How do we identify them? And what can you do to ask the members? Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I, I showed the pre in the previous slide. Or I mean, maybe I didn't show that slide. Yeah, that is uh, uh, in the list of uh, uh, that published by that man, uh, uh, Jeff ne Beal. Uh, I, I went to that list and found three African journals that were created by publishers that are on, on Beal's list. Um, this, these journals are now going to have a, a predatory label attached to their name. They're going to, make it, they're going to find it very difficult to survive uh, once they have that. That's why I, I so strongly object to that uh, very principle of having such a list. Uh, you don't have to, as an organization, I don't think, tell authors not to publish in any of those journals. The authors have to make their own decision. Uh, 
they, they, they can tell that the publisher looks rubbish by just looking at the output that that publisher is, is having. For example, if it has no articles at all, it's always difficult to be the first one, and you, you don't really want to be the first one. But if you're courageous, that's what you do. Uh, and it's up to the author to make, take that risk. It's not up to somebody in America defining uh, a, a, a list which sounds very much like uh, a list published by a previous administration on the axis of evil. You, you did say you wanted to take that discussion forward, so perhaps we can just lay a few things down to talk. I agree with you to a very large extent, because it's very easy to slap a label on to African journals. But I wonder if we shouldn't formulate a few ideas about how a scholar can judge a good journal, apart from the obvious ones. Because if I look at some of the journals that I think really are a bit dodgy, I will see, for example, that there's a whole list of journals and big splash and only one article in each. Well, that might be okay because they're beginning, but then you look at the editorial boards and they're probably made up because they're very bizarre. You'll have a journal on sleeping sickness and the editorial board will come from um, Malaysia. Um, and, and you know, sort of odd things like that. You have to begin to get a sense of, of what you look at to see if a journal's for real or not. And for the research organizations, it might be an idea to help with that rather than sticking labels on things. I won't comment on that. Uh, 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 a couple of weeks ago, I was at a meeting in, in Rotterdam with Tom as, as one of the organizers of the meeting discussing that very issue. Uh, and we didn't really come to any, any good conclusion except perhaps to oblige or to suggest to uh, publishers to get uh, a, a, a label of quality uh, by some board. And that, and that has, is, is a way out, isn't it? I mean, if the publisher has a, has a label of quality, it's like anything. You want to buy a new jumper or something, it has to have a label of quality. And uh, so that's, that's a bond possibility. Um, just to comment on that, um, when Climate Central, together with Gloss and Hindawi and Coaction, we uh, co founded the Open Access Quality Publishers Association, one of the drivers there was to try and ensure that good practice from open to publishers was uh, recognized and the standards were maintained. And recently, during Open Access Week, OASPA published a blog describing the membership process, describing the types of changes which members have made as a result of the feedback they get during the membership process, also noting that by no means all those that apply are admitted. And so more and more organizations are looking at OASPA membership as a, a meaningful sign of good practice for open access journals. And so this sort of positive sign of good practice is potentially less damaging than a kind of an ad hoc attempt to create lists of uh, journals which may be questionable because there's a big difference between being questionable versus actually um, be problematic. So uh, a positive measure of, of policy is something which um, OASPA is certainly trying to achieve. Um, we'll be hearing from Tom this afternoon, who's involved in those discussions as well, and, and there'll be a panel discussion this afternoon, so maybe we can, sorry, if we pick that up there to talk about more this afternoon. Okay, thank you. Um, so, almost ready for lunch, so um, actually one final thank you to Marcel for his presentation and his input.